This is a review of One Piece the Dress Rosa arc episodes 647 through 652. If you haven't seen through episode 652 of One Piece, then you should not watch this video because there will be spoilers. Yes! Progression! Moving forward on all fronts! One Piece! I think we can all agree that we wish the pacing was a lot better in One Piece, but when those advancements finally do happen, they're really rewarding. Obviously some of those advancements are a lot more rewarding than others, but I think just about every story has taken a step forward. Mostly, anyway. I don't think Sanji's group or Nami's group have progressed at all since the last review, but that's still something. I'm extremely disheartened by the fact that I've almost totally caught up with One Piece and I still don't know what I'm gonna do when I get to that fateful day. There's a couple of different options to choose from, like picking up the manga or watching and reviewing week by week, or waiting six weeks and then reviewing a chunk of together, I, I don't know. Again, we'll get there when we get there, and for now let's just look at what we have. There were a bunch of big Colosseum-related revelations, and even though I'm not enjoying the Colosseum a whole lot, let's start with those. And let's get the boring, stupid one out of the way first. Don Xinjiao and his stupid, stupid conflict. I wasn't sure why I wasn't able to get into Xinjiao's character and subplot, but then when I saw his flashback and the reason for his anger, I was like, aha! That's why. As soon as I realized that he was all bent out of shape because he lost his point, well, first, I paused immediately and watched a movie from my childhood, The Point, narrated by Ringo Starr. If you haven't seen it, that movie's a trip. You should go watch it. But then, once I went back to One Piece, I figured that Luffy would have some way to resolve this conflict, and then he did. Which means that all of the conflict we experienced thus far with Xin Zhao was utterly pointless. When they did it with Sanji and Duval, it was funny. Mostly because it was handled in a very light-hearted and fun way. And no one can overreact like Sanji can. But I guess Chin Zhao was just so tedious that by the time he got his point returned, we didn't really care because he had taken up so much of our time already. I'm going to assume that he's going to stick around to some degree so that he can repay the favor somehow. Much like Duval, again. But, um, I imagine, aside from that, we're pretty much done with him. Hallelujah! Maybe that means we can get to more interesting characters and subplots. That seems like a good way to segue into talking about Rebecca, but screw that! We're talking about Bartolomeo, the biggest Luffy fanboy on the planet. I loved this plot twist because I did not see it coming until it was here in full force. And it was excellent because he was introduced alongside all of these people who had stupid grudges against Luffy. So you thought, okay, it's just another guy with a stupid grudge. I see Bartolomeo and Cavendish as kind of foils for one another, whose silliness validates the other. Cavendish is beautiful, yet stupid. And his goal to defeat Luffy is based on the fact that he wants to be more popular and not something with actual meaning behind it. Bartolomeo is a hideous blemish on the face of humanity, but he's our ally and he's defending Luffy's honor and he's gonna go on and perhaps help us in our quest. Normally you'd expect the handsome guy to be the hero and the ugly guy to be the villain because it's just easier to imagine people that way. This plot twist about Bartolomeo immediately changed my opinion of him the second I realized what was going on. I went from indifferent to completely in love and I didn't mind the five minute flashback we had to go through because it was hilarious. It makes me wonder who else was in the crowd and who may have been influenced by the incident at Logtown. It's a lot like how Roger's execution inspired Smoker to become a marine. Luffy's almost execution inspired Bartolomeo to become a pirate. And a Luffy fat boy. Now let's talk about Rebecca. Man, her story was basically just the story of Bambi, if Bambi had a toy soldier to take care of him after his mother was shot. Let's all deal with the fact that the toy soldier used to be human. Probably used to be that forgotten warrior at the Colosseum that there was a statue of him. And he's probably Rebecca's dad. Maybe. Because Doflamingo has a devil fruit which turns people into toys, he's doing that for some reason. <laughs> Likely all the people who might potentially oppose him, but how's he doing the memory erasing thing? Is that 
part of the turning into the toy process, or is that a different Devil Fruit user altogether? And King Riku, Gladiator Ricky, it's not the most subtle thing ever, but I did say it, even though it was meant to be a joke at the time. I did say it. Maybe Ricky is another displaced king. But through Rebecca's flashback, we learned a little bit about Dressrosa history, which was that it was very poor until Doflamingo rolled in. And that's great and all that, but can we really trust Doflamingo's money to not be dirty? It seems to me like Doflamingo had the same plan as Crocodile, except Doflamingo succeeded, obviously, and didn't have anyone stop him from taking over a country. But I guess the people don't really care, because they support their new king, so much so that they have begun to hate their old king, and even go to the Colosseum to watch people kill each other for sport. Rebecca is staunchly hated as the granddaughter of the previous king, and has to win a thousand Colosseum fights in order to go free. I felt the attempt to kill Luffy part was a little rushed, and didn't leave any impact on me. Felt like an excuse to get needlessly emotional, and um, didn't seem necessary. But now Rebecca is fighting in the D-block, and her only competition is Cavendish, and his reason for fighting is much less important than hers. So I think maybe she's going to win. That is, of course, unless they introduce someone who was there the whole time but never mentioned previous to the fight starting. And that's enough talk about the Colosseum, because... It's not going to be interesting until Doflamingo's men get out there. There's no sense in talking about Team Sanji or Team Nami because they were pretty stagnant in these episodes. Frankie met up with Zoro, and then the two of them met up with Robin and Usopp, and they all became legendary heroes. Actually, then Zoro left again, and now he's met up with Sanji and Kinemon, so... But, you know, he's still a legendary hero. <laughs> the Tontata people are affiliated with the Toy Soldier, and all marching against Doflamingo in order to rescue their 500 buddies who are being forced to work at the factory. Also, their princess, who apparently is a colossal bitch, but they're so warm-hearted and jolly that they want to rescue her too. At first, I thought it was a little crazy that the crew shows up exactly when all of this stuff is about to go down. But then I took a moment to think about the fact that they're really the catalyst for all this shit happening, because Doflamingo set up the tournament to trap Luffy, and the Tontata were waiting for their legendary hero, which Usopp claimed he was. They've definitely arrived at places where the timing is just far too perfect, like in Drum Island or as far back as the Captain Kuro arc, or as recently as the Fishman Island arc. But this time there's an excuse, because Doflamingo is trying to bait the crew and punish Law. Law is in a very bad situation, because everyone accidentally abandoned him. He tried to call Nami's group for help, but there really, realistically, wasn't anything that they could have done for him. So Law only ended up being able to flee because his elaborate plan just fell apart. He was alone, staring at one person who wants to kill him, and one person who wants to capture him. And I can't be entirely sure what Fujitora's devil fruit is, because he's like summoning meteors down from the heavens, but also he seems to have control over gravity. Unless his control of gravity can also somehow summon meteors down from the heavens. Whatever the explanation is, it's still super cool. So Doflamingo took too long trying to kill Law, so Fujitora was able to sweep in, almost kind of rescue Law, and arrest him. I guess at this point we can assume that Law has been officially arrested, although I'm not too scared for him because we all know how far Luffy will go for his friends. And even though Law would never admit it, they are far more than allies. They are friends, damn it. So once he's done with his Coliseum shenanigans and finds out what happens to Law, then he's on the case. And Doflamingo, meanwhile, will continue to tease us about his connection to the Celestial Dragons. Every time he looks like he's going to tell us about how they're connected, something happens, like Fujitora arrives, or the episode ends. But just because an episode ends with a teaser that Doflamingo's gonna tell us about how he and the Celestial Dragons are connected, doesn't mean that the next episode will open with that explanation. There's one more thing worth noting, which is sort of Colosseum related, but it's actually more about the future than anything else. Blackbeard's man, Burgess, figured out who Luffy is, because how could you not? and set up a situation so that Luffy could talk to Blackbeard on the Den Den Mushi. Even though Blackbeard didn't directly kill 
Ace or Whitebeard. He did selfishly betray them and set up the situation where they were killed. He's already destroyed Whitebeard's memory by eating his devil fruit, and now he wants to do the same thing to Ace. It's really the biggest insult he could do to Luffy, and I don't think he originally went into it with the intention of hurting Luffy's feelings in that way, but now that it's happening, he's definitely taking advantage of it. Regardless of the foes that Luffy meets in the future, Blackbeard's always going to be there, and he's always going to be the worst. It's hard to believe that when we met him, he was just Pie Guy back in Mock Town. <gasps> That's the third connection to the Skypea saga! Norland, Bellamy, Blackbeard. I know it's a stretch, but I'm taking the trifecta. Anyway, the next One Piece video that you're going to see from me is a watching of the next two episodes. Then an examination of the six episodes after that, which I believe is 655 through 660. And that worked out quite nicely because everyone was saying that 661 really needed to be uh, watching. So anyway, I guess I'll just see you next for episodes 653 and 654. Bye! He was alone, staring at one guy who wants to kill him, and one guy who wants to ca- uh, uh <laughs> Also, they're a princess, who is apparently a colossal bitch, but they're so cold- cold- no. <laughs> Man. Her story was basically the story of Bambi. If Bambi had a toy soldier to take care of her, him. Bambi was a boy. Yeah, Bambi was a boy.